um, can inspire you and in, in turn I hope that you can do some great work that inspires me. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Chris Garbett and I am the Executive Prayer Director of um, Ogilvy Paris. I'm not French, uh, actually I'm South African, um, but I've been living in Paris for about eight years. Uh, I've been in Ogilvy for two years. Before that I worked at TBWA Paris for about six years. And previous to that I was at TBWA Hukuskaras in Johannesburg. I've called my presentation In an Ideal World. And the reason is because I think if we do our jobs right, ideally what we set out to do will be effective. But when you look at the times today, it's a different world than it was five years ago. Things have changed dramatically. And I think if we don't contextualize our work within this new current situation we're in, we're not going to be as effective as we could be. So today is going to really be about that. It's going to be about some tips that I picked up along the way, some kind of work practices that we, we put into play in Paris. And also it's going to be talking about a new methodology that we're working with at the moment called the Big Ideal. So where do I begin? Well, I think, I think let's start with the shocking truth, which not a lot of people in the industry actually feel comfortable acknowledging, but people hate advertising. And, and, and this is true, I mean, I think we've created this perception ourselves um, through, through the last 20 years of work we've done. And I think we thought we could manipulate the consumer into believing what we had to sell. But unfortunately, I think we underestimate the consumer. And here's a little film just to show you one French consumer's point of view about advertising. Hopefully you can read the subtitles. Oh. Je pas armé, on a appris à travers les études, etc. à mieux la décrypter. Et aujourd'hui, on a, a l'impression d'avoir été un peu les mains de la farce, euh, d'avoir consommé des produits qu'on ne voulait pas, qu'on n'a pas choisi, et qu'on n'a pas besoin de bar, euh, si on a un ailleur, euh, enrichi en tas de vitamines. On n'a pas besoin de ça, on n'a pas besoin de boire du coca, et pourquoi on le fait C'est de reprendre un petit peu le, le pouvoir sur sa consommation et, et choisir euh, son mode de consommation avec euh, un pouvoir qui nous a été donné. C'est celui de l'argent. Donc euh, on se rend compte en fait qu'au niveau individuel, ça ne paraît pas grand chose, mais plus, plus on est nombreux, plus en fait on peut avoir un impact sur euh, le modèle de société qui, dans lequel on, on va évoluer nous et également nos enfants. C'est kind of frightening, but I mean, there's a lot of people out there that actually don't value our, our, our profession as much as I think we all do here. And the danger with the award show is you become very inwardly focused and you start awarding ads and, and, and it becomes an inward industry kind of um, event and I think we've got to respect what the consumers thinking out there. Here's another little film just to show you something interesting. Oh. 
high inside our glass towers. Our greatest minds prepare to respond. Well, uh, can't we just not log in back at them? Oh, yeah, but where's the money in that? The point is, everything's changed. We've been disintermediated, distrusted, and just plain just People don't like being sold to anymore. They want to decide for themselves. Why? Because they've heard all the same old stories before, and they've lost the trust. And quite frankly, why should they believe what hasn't been true in the past? We're in a, we're in a financial crisis. There's an era of distrust in the world. People don't trust politicians, they don't trust banks anymore, and you guess it, they don't trust us anymore either. Media's exploded. Digital technologies, TiVo, and the internet have made it possible for people to avoid most of the commercial messages we put forward. Our once beloved television spots, the cornerstone of every self-respecting media plan, have been sidelined and are being called ICBMs, isolated commercial brand messages. Penetration of the internet, DVDs, video on demand continues to rise quickly. Digital technologies are part of our lives wherever we are. And mobile phones are like an extension of our bodies, with text messaging, built-in cameras, email, music, and video. Gaming is growing like gangbusters, as are all forms of consumer-generated media. And while the human race races forward like never before, we seem to be lagging behind. In the US and Europe alone, Consumers are spending up to 25% of their media time online. While our clients lag behind, investing in most countries less than 6% of their media budget online. And that's why many people are saying that we're truly stuck. Our 200 year old model of content is dying fast. Prime time viewing is redundant. Online content is choice driven. Newspapers and magazines are probably going to disappear soon. Research and procurement is killing creativity and spontaneity. Google has one third of online revenue, ad revenue, sorry, with no creative media, thank you very much. Clients believe their agencies just don't get it. And consumers are turning, into, turning from accepting targets into vicious critics. So you might say that we truly stuff. Unless you look on the bright side, and I think there's a, there's a huge bright side to this. We've got much more opportunities than ever before to try new stuff, creatively. We have more ways to connect with people than ever before. We can be our own networks, free media for them. We can get closer than ever to consumers, and we can infiltrate culture in new ways. If you look at the latest trends, I just looked over the last three to four years of the latest trends that I've been spotting in award shows and in the industry. There are a few, a few clues already um, emerging of how, how you can do this. And I've, I've put my finger on four clues so far. The first one is ads don't seem like ads anymore. And I think that's a huge clue. If you come across as being an ad again, before anybody's even taken the time to, to listen to what you have to say, You've got a 99% chance of being dismissed. Ads are becoming more entertaining driven. They seem like short feature films. And here's one example which you probably all know, so just give me an idea.
So, two big trends. Ads don't seem like ads anymore. Biggest stunts. On less budget, actually, as well, and using free media. Genius. And the third thing which I picked up is uh, um, brands, because of the explosion of media, are, are, are able to tell much deeper, richer stories, which is a huge, huge blessing for us. I mean, we've got, we're in a new age where we can start to tell stories. Gone are the days of being restricted by 30 seconds. So, so production companies have to relook really at the way we, we, we do production, because we can tell stories. We can create dialogue with consumers for months on end with the same platform. Um, and this is a great example of that, HBO. This quality is really bad, excuse us for that. HBO wanted a piece of communication that said, we're the greatest storytellers in the world, and we're going to tell those stories not just in TV, but in a wide variety of means. So, instead of creating a piece that just said those things, we created a media program that demonstrated those things. The program launched with street foods passing out curious invitations to a week-long summer evening New York event. These invitations directed people to the city lower east side, where a short film was projected onto the side of a building. Using two high-deck projectors, the film created the illusion that the side of the building had been removed, giving you a view into eight different apartments. A lot of brands are allying with consumers and with people by finding a common value or a common ideal. And this is what I want to talk about specifically today, a little bit later on. I'd like to share a couple of, um, in the last four, five, six years of my experience in advertising, I was at TVWA in Paris and we had a, a theory there about advertising as an intruder. And as I said at the beginning of the presentation, people hate ads. 99% of ads on TV, on French TV, are, are, are like wallpaper. They're, they're so cliche. They fit into the same category safely because the name of the game is not taking risks. And there's very few marketing directors out there who actually are prepared to take risks. And um, this is actually in a crisis situation, probably the worst mistake people can make. Because if you don't stand out, you're never going to get noticed. And we used to think about this in terms of this very simple theory called the theory of the first, second, and the vacuum cleaner. So imagine you get home from work, you're really tired, you've had a long day, you don't feel like speaking to anyone, you don't feel like socializing, you're exhausted, you go into your apartment, you close the door, you start up, you go online, and you're just beginning to get into your own world and exploring, and all of a sudden, boom, boom, boom on the door, there's like a loud knock, and you're like, oh, who could that be at this late hour? And you get up gradually and you go to the door and you open the door and you see this cheesy looking, cliche, bad taste vacuum cleaner salesman standing outside your door and you look down and he's holding a bog standard, boring old vacuum cleaner and within the first few seconds he says something really basic to you which you've heard a million times before. What are you going to do? I know what I'd do. I'd probably just close the door in his face and carry on with what I was doing before. But imagine if you opened the door and there was like some interesting looking character standing there, dressed differently. And within the first two seconds he said something intriguing or inspiring to you that got your attention. And disarmed you in a way. And, and, and it was unexpected. You might consider giving him a little bit more time to hear what he's got to say. And it's not rocket science, but this is exactly the same as what we do. We all just glorify a vacuum cleaner salesman. So we'd better be bloody good at it. We, we've got to get people's attention in less than two seconds. That's the first thing. If you don't get people's attention, they're not going to listen to what you have to say. And then you've got to entertain them or inspire them and hold them transfixed long enough to develop a relationship with them. And here's an example of, of how you can do this in a very simple print media. Now, you can either love that or hate that, but that's got stopping power. Imagine you're flipping through a magazine you're not going to carry on flipping, it's going to stop you. And then you're probably going to spend a few, a few minutes looking at it and exploring it, and it creates a reaction. And we used to train our creators this way, we used to say, well, it's kind of a cheesy expression, but play running creativity is, is how we used to frame it. And I still teach a lot of students and stuff, and I take them through this very basic process, and this can be applied to all different types of creativity, all different types of media. I think there's often a, a misconception and a mix-up between media and idea. And I like to try and separate the two because I just I think media is just a, a way to, to, to explode your idea in all different ways. So 
Blade running creativity. I think before before one executes your idea, whether it be in web or on TV or in print or whatever it is, ask yourself when you find an idea, what type of idea is it? What type of emotion do you want people to feel when they look at it? Is it a, a cute idea? Is it a funny idea? Is it a shocking idea? Is it a poetic idea? Is it an inspiring idea? Choose one register. So often I see ideas that are executed with a confusion of tone of voice. And there's no, there's no single-minded point of view in execution. And I think this dilutes the effect that it has on people. Once you've got your register, once you've chosen what emotional reaction you want people to feel, push that idea to the edge of the blade. Push it right to the edge of whatever emotion you want people to feel. And exploit that emotion to the maximum point that you're allowed to and that you can. And try not to lose too many battles along the way. Don't dismiss your idea if it seems to lack clout or punch. Um, find the heart of the idea, the, the emotional intent of the idea, and, and, and push it. It's interesting when you look at how some of these ideas progress from concept stage through to execution. That was the idea of, of um, the rebirth ad that you just seen. And this was a brief that was in Asia for quite a long time, and a lot of teams came up with lots of ideas, and we saw this. And what edge is that on? What kind of, does that give you an emotional reaction? Not really. Is it on the edge of clever? Not really. Is it on the edge of shocking? Not really. Is it on the edge of funny? Not really. And so many creators have stopped right then and there and, and spent a lot of energy trying to sell that to the client. Then they would have gone into pre-production and then they spent ages trying to choose a photographer and a model maker. They probably would have prepped how to make the egg what colour to make the yolk, the casting of a guy. And quite honestly, it's a complete waste of time. Because if they spent maybe another half a day pushing the idea to the edge of shocking and clever, maybe they would have come up with something a little bit better. This is another idea that we, we were working on a PlayStation. And again, it, it, it's not that clever. It's kind of interesting. It's not that shocking, it's not that funny. But when you really interrogate the idea and dig down deep beneath the surface, you find the heart of what's interesting about that. It's the subject of war mixed with PlayStation. And when you start exploring the emotions attached to war, there's a lot of like effect emotion that stays with you after, after the, the time of post-traumatic stress syndrome. When you take that emotion and you mix that with gaming, suddenly the idea is much bigger and much more emotional than a clever, posterized thought with some twisted kind of visual medals. And the idea of the medals is minimized, and, and it's more about the, the emotion. And when the French get emotional like that, they truly get it right. And I think this is a beautiful example of really strong emotional advertising. And it didn't just stop at the medals, and then the tattoos and badges. So that's a good example again of a blade running idea. Here are some more examples I think. This is on the edge for me of, of strange and intriguing. This is, on the, this is on the edge of ridiculously stupid and funny. This campaign to me is on the edge of emotion. And again, I think whatever we do is going to move people to feel something strong enough to, to either change their habits or to act. And, and this really arrests you in that two to three seconds because it's visually really beautiful. And then beneath it, you, you empathize with these stars because you feel the effort and the, the pain that they've gone through to create their music. And this was for anti-piracy in the EMI. That's my favorite, because I mean, you really do feel the pain of Joe Cocker's vocal cords. This was from Listen. Um, again, this is, uh, it says explore 4x4, four four. you can't really read it from that distance. But um, again, from this is on the edge of intriguing. Creating a new, new world out there that nobody's ever seen before. Encouraging people to go out and explore. This is on the edge of shopping. A lot of people hated this campaign, um, but it definitely would stop you and make you think.
So this is one way of breaking through to people. It's kind of the first part of the theory of having ads that have stopping power. But at Ogilvy, we believe we need to contextualize these ideas within the current times we live in. Especially now, because things have changed dramatically. I believe ideas have to be pushed, pushed to the edge. But first we need to start with a vision of what we want to achieve with the idea. So how do, we, how do we inspire people to act? That's the question. That's the question that we started playing with about two years ago. It's great getting people's attention and stopping them, but once you have that attention, what do you do with it? How do you capitalize on that attention? Well, we believe that excellence needs relevance. As previously mentioned, today's world is not what it was yesterday, and thankfully this is wonderful news for all of us. Today there are loads of new tensions and trends emerging because of the crisis, because of political change, because of lots of wars happening over the place, and you know, there's a whole counter um, reaction to war, this movement of positivity on it. Um, and these trends and tensions are crying out to be used in our industry. Today, they learn, you know, society is also taking back the power. They, they're tired of being spoken to. They want to speak with the brand. They, they want to take part. They want to lead. They want to decide for themselves. And this, this to me is an amazing example of how people want to take part in something rather than receive something. It's a project that Gene did called the Bubble Project. Um, and it was a book that he created after he did it. And pretty much all he did is he went around, um, I think it was New York, and he stuck up a lot of empty speech bubbles on different posters and media. And people just filled in their own, their own dialogue on the posters. And that's a great example of what people think about advertising these days. It's called Talk Back. And he got some fantastic um, quotes from people. I lost my family to cancer. It's consumers out there, that's what they think. So, I think it's time that brands and advertisers started giving something back to people instead of stealing their precious time. And this is where brands, like points of view in the world or ideals, will be extremely effective in the future. I must, I must admit that normally I'm a skeptic when it comes to theories or methodologies or strategic workshops. And in my experience, I haven't sat in a lot of those types of workshops where it's made a huge impression on me as a creator. But what I'm going to show you, I think is, is really, really interesting because it, it, it opens a door to creativity that resonates with consumers. And it, it ends up being a simple one phrase which points creators in the right direction to finding wonderful ideas that inspire and create a reaction. We started looking at, at what the industry was already saying. And everyone, everyone out there is talking about big ideas. You know, we, we did a survey of different home pages. And please don't take offense if any of you in the room are part of some of these agencies. It's just a, a study we did. Ideas and ideas, creative business ideas, idea centric, better ideas, return on ideas, big ideas, ideas that ignite the energy in brands. It, it's actually quite cliche, and everyone's talking about ideas. And even in the program of talks in the next two, three days, half of them are about ideas. Obviously, it's about ideas. But it's kind of ironic because we tell our clients that we should differentiate their brands. And meanwhile, the starting point from a lot of, a lot of uh, people out there is talking about big ideas. So we, we looked at, we didn't come up with a new concept as such. We looked at what was working out there in the market already and how people attach themselves to certain iconic brands. And we said, well, what's the difference between a big idea and what they're doing? And we took this and we just modernized it a little bit by adding an L. And we called it the big ideal. And it's, it's really, really simple in fact. How does it work? So we trademarked it, obviously. And 
This is how it works. Very basic, but you end up with something really, really tangible to work from. You look at the brand's best self, I mean, the history of the brand, and the strengths of the brand. And then you look at a social, cultural, or a relevant tensional trend out there in, in society today that's relevant to the brand and to consumers who you talk about. And then you cross the two in the most powerful mix that you can make. And you come up with a big idea for a brand. And the rule with the big idea for a brand is it should always start with this. The world would be better if. And there's been a lot of debates around this because, I mean, you know, it sounds kind of pretentious, you know, advertising to save the world. But I'll explain later how you can apply it differently. And I love this beginning point for, for creativity because it forces brands to add value in the world or to improve something in somebody's life or to offer the human race and the planet something world-changing or something useful in the form of an experience or a product or a service. We didn't invent the theory, but a lot of clever people in the industry and in the world have been doing it for many years already. But we, we have been playing with it with ourselves. This is an example of something. <laughs> Serious or inspiring, 
Because, I mean, we're an advertiser. We've got to have a bit of a sense of humor. We can't take ourselves too seriously. There's a lot of products which have got interesting attributes that you want to sell still. And it's not all value-based advertising. Um, and a big idea at any time, of course. If you take Axe, for example, the world would be better if normal guys could have hot girls very easy. What an amazing platform to work on for like the next 10 years. I mean, every creator in the world is dying to work on Axe. So I'll show you a couple more ideas and, and examples of this from, from our Paris agency. We got a brief to um, work on, on Scrabble. And Scrabble is a board game, which is probably one of the oldest board games in the world, very classical. And it had been kind of marginalized in the world into a kind of intellectual space for old fashioned, old fighting down people. And when you look at the world and all the competition out there with electronic gaming and interactive gaming and what's happening with Wii, I mean, it's a tall order to try and get people excited about Scrabble again. So we started looking at, um, at Scrabble as a brand. We said, as a brand, the best self of Scrabble is great moments of fun with friends and families around words. And then we looked at attention. We found some really interesting things about language and vocabulary in the world. Because of all this modern technology, about every generation uses about one third of their dialogue and their vocabulary every, every, every generation. So, and with this also there's invention of new types of languages with uh, blogging and with, with texting and stuff, a lot of abbreviated slang. So we said, for well, attention, words are the key to treasure, they open the world to us. The more we know, the better we can grow, yet words are in great danger. And this is true. With text messages, poorly spelled emails, ominous images, and less vocabulary. So we said the big ideal could be the world would be better if we rediscovered the magic of words. And that was the brief we gave the creators. And that's also quite difficult to do because as soon as you start trying to be intellectual and play word games, and you get boxed into this category of crossword puzzles and old fashioned kind of games. Um, and it's a dangerous space. So we think, well, how can we get people excited and energized around words again? And we started saying, well, what happens if we, if we make words accessible again? So this inaccessible, exclusive little club that only certain people would belong to, make it accessible and fun and creative and natural. So the first thing we did execution is change the game from spelling words to playing with objects and things in life. And we decided to take the route of pictures. To, to show how fun and magical this world can be. And we collaborated with artists around the world and also musicians. And we took word groups and we got all our credits to write. And then we wrote songs from those word groups which made really cool, like crazy, lateral Im images and, and worlds. And we mixed this with, uh, with, um, with pictures. We did, we've done a TV campaign, we've done a print campaign, we're doing an online platform, we're doing a project with musicians, we've got a huge territory which we can own now. So here's the start. <coughs> Sing on. Hello. A one, two, three, four. Where Sumo Joe meets a man who could buy and put some dough in his hand. This white is glad, his baby's sad. The spider's never had so bad. The red balloon is blowing. Clap the timber too. Of the little boy and his brother Roy Make you think you're seeing too Whoa, mischief miss is at it again As critters march toward two men Mr. Acrobat spins hair balloon Round and round in a cloud of blue Where a ram got lost in the kitchen And parachute band with the spray paint campaigns Rainbows on your shoes
Um, and this is all evolving to become one story now we're starting to die much more. 
the deeper richer story as well. Um, I'm not going to show you that as a case study of the web, but we've done a lot of web already. We just finished a project with the, the 25th anniversary of the landing on the moon, um, with Buzz Aldrin, Sally Ryan, and Jim Lovell. And we created a whole web platform around that and a story about it, where you can watch their story from different points of view. Guidance for this. 15, 14, 13, Shocking, but I think it really works. 